Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello, I am Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and through it, we seek to be drawn closer and closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to our loving Heavenly Father, into that deep personal relationship, that deep intimate relationship that He wants to have with every single one of us. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and loving Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for this day. It is a beautiful day that you have made. We rejoice. We are glad in it. We rejoice in you. We adore you. We thank you. We ask, Holy Spirit, now that you would be our teacher and guide as we continue uh, studying the book of First Samuel. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we met together, we heard how King Saul once again disobeyed the crystal clear instructions of the Lord which he had received from Samuel. What was the reason he gave for his disobedience? He feared his men rather than fearing God. He revered his men over God. Not a wise choice on his part. It is never wise to fear or to revere people over God. God is God. Who are people that we should revere them? Yes, it is possible. If we do not follow the dictates and the desires of people, uh, we may suffer for our choice. But Saul lost the position he had with God. And God regretted that he had made Saul king. I pray that we would live in such a way that God rejoices because we honor him through how we conduct our lives and in how we carry out the assignments he has given us. There will be no greater words to hear when we meet our Lord face to face than to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, come and share your master's happiness. Because, Saul's dis because of Saul's disobedience, the Lord sought out a man after his own heart, and that man was David, son of Jesse of Bethlehem, Judah. David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. He tended his father's sheep, and he was a gifted musician. He played the lyre. It's a, a lyre is a small harp-like stringed instrument. Now David entered into the, into the service of Saul after the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And when Saul was tormented by a spirit that, we, that is called in the scriptures an evil spirit from the Lord, David would play his harp, his lyre, and relief would come to Saul. When we met together last time, we began reading the biblical account of David facing the giant Goliath. Let's return to that story now, hearing it again from the beginning of 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched their tent at Aphes Damim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Um, his, his height was six cubits and a span. Now that is more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. Now, on his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung over his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's about 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. 
Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. I'm going to stop briefly here. Now what do you suppose, as I mentioned last time, Saul's men might have been thinking? Well, they probably were thinking something along the lines of we're just grasshoppers compared to this giant. And they were probably thinking, well, who in the world could possibly face this giant and win? Now, if these were their primary thoughts and fears, well, then their focus was on themselves and their own inabilities and inadequacies rather than on the Lord and the Lord's ability to overcome any foe. We're about to hear, though, that David has a different focus and a different spirit resting on him. He, having been anointed by Samuel, had the spirit of the living God upon him. And very soon, the Philistines and Israel are going to see what the Lord could do through his anointed one. Let's keep reading. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take it Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, and he ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and said, and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. As we can hear, David's focus is not on the size of Goliath. His focus is on the size of his God. 
Compared to God, Goliath was nothing. And David knew it. Oh, do we face our personal giants, trusting in the knowledge that our God is greater and bigger than anything we might ever face? Let's not look to our inadequacy or inflate our fears. Let's look to God for whom nothing is impossible. Now Saul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Okay. Obviously, Saul is looking at the appearance of David. He is considering his youth. He is considering all that, in his opinion, David doesn't have, rather than what he does have. David doesn't see what he doesn't have. All he sees is an uncircumcised Philistine who has come out to defy the armies of the living God. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried to walk around, but he was not used to them. <coughs> Isn't it interesting that David's trust was in God, but Saul wanted to clothe him in worldly military armor? Such a mix was most definitely not going to work here. And it often doesn't work in many of the trials and difficulties we face. We must face our giants in the strength of the Lord and in his armor. For us, most of the struggles we will face are going to be spiritual in nature. And it is impossible to face spiritual enemies with physical weapons and in physical armor. Spiritual warfare demands that we use the weapons and the armament of the spirit which God has given to each Christian. When we put on the armor God has issued to us, we clothe ourselves with God. We clothe ourselves with his truth. We clothe ourselves with Christ's righteousness. We clothe ourselves with the peace we have with God because we trust in Jesus. We clothe ourselves with faith in God who is our shield. We clothe ourselves with the salvation we have in, in Christ who protects our head. And we have as our sword God's own word which is in our hands. There simply is no better armor on earth which can surpass the armor God has already issued to every single believer. Let's put God's armor on daily because it is from God. It's for spiritual warfare. And it's easy to walk in and to wield to the glory of God and to the dismay of the enemy. I cannot go in these, David said to Saul, because I am not used to them, so he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Exactly. The battle did belong to the Lord, and the Lord would not allow his anointed servant to suffer defeat. Notice the next verse, that David is going to be running quickly toward the battle line to meet Goliath. I love it. We do not need to fear when we face our enemies. We only need to go in the strength of the Lord. So let's read on. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from its sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, As surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, Find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, my young man? Uh, Saul asked him, David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. Sam, 1 Samuel 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as, as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men and David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. 
When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merib. I will give you to her in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. But David said to Saul, Who am I, and what is my family, or my clan in Israel, that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Merib, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Meholah. Now Saul's daughter Michael was in love with David, and when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may become a snare to him and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, Now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. Then Saul ordered his attendants, Speak to David privately and say, Look, the king likes you, and his attendants all love you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David, but David said, Do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I am only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servant told him what David had said, Saul replied, Say to David, The king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the allotted time elapsed, David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. They counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter Michael in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved him, Saul became still more afraid of him and remained his enemy the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. All right, this this chapter points out time and time again how the Lord was with David and not Saul. Saul's only thought, though he had been already told that the kingdom of Israel would be given to another because of his own disobedience, his only thought was to destroy the one whom the Lord had chosen to take his place. But the Lord was with David. The Lord had chosen David. The Lord was not going to let the next anointed king of Israel see defeat. In 1 Samuel 19, In in this chapter, Saul again tries to kill David. But Saul's son, Jonathan, comes to his defense. Now, Jonathan knows that David hasn't done anything to harm his father. His father is just simply jealous and raging with jealousy. And Michael, Saul's daughter, David's wife, helps David escape before Saul's men are able to kill him. One does need to wonder as we read through 1 Samuel 19 why Michael has an idol in their house large enough to be mistaken as a full-grown man. Um, She's going to use that idol to trick Saul's men. But one has to wonder why she's got that in her household. So let's read 1 Samuel 19. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him. My father, Saul, is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. 
Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Before I read further, let me just say that some of the good that we are going to be doing in our life will be repaid with evil. This is simply a fact that we must face because we live in a sin-filled world. Just because this may happen to us, and probably will happen to us, but let's not let this fact prevent us. Let's not let this fact prevent us from doing good. Remember, we are commissioned by God to be his representatives and ambassadors in the world. We're to be imitators of the loving nature of our God. It is the Lord Jesus himself who has commanded us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We are never to return evil for evil, but we are told in the scriptures to overcome evil with good. So now, let's read on. Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more, war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove his spear into the wall. And that night, David made good his escape. That's where we're going to end for today. And let's just, uh, let me just bless you. And uh, it's such a wonderful day that the Lord has made. You know, the, David himself has said, we just rejoice and are glad in it. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, that you bless us as you do. We do not deserve any of your blessings, but we thank you for each and every one of them. I ask now that you bless the people who are listening to me. I ask you to bless them as only you can. But I bless them with the words you gave to Aaron. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love, and regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share or would like to purchase a CD of this message and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.